Ladies and gentlemen, so great that you're here. This is the most important session in all of All That Matters. If you didn't know it, now you do. We've got something really interesting. First of all, welcome. Great that you are here. Great to see you all here because this is an important session. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce somebody who is really one of the key architects of the future of music, fan engagement, and the linkage between the two. Would you please give a warm round of applause to the CEO of Napster 2023 to 2040, John Vlasopoulos. Okay, so to begin with, John, I think we should just say, Napster that people used to think about is completely, utterly different from the Napster of the present and the future. Explain briefly why, and then please tell us about what you're doing in terms of connecting the superfan, their usage of music, and the whole engagement with music. Thank you, Ralph. Good, mo good morning, everyone. That was the most awesome hype from Rich and, uh, and Ralph. I feel, I feel special. So, uh, so yeah, the, the Napster of the old days, so I worked on Napster back in 99 when I was at a company called Bertelsmann, and uh, back then, Napster was the peer-to-peer -peer network. So who, who in the room maybe used Napster? We won't come after you, okay? It's all good. Um, so, uh, so yes, very different experience back then. We at Bertelsmann lent them $50 million and then took a billion dollar offer to the music industry to legitimize what was um, the first really experience of digital music for, for fans and social media, right? You could chat to different people on the platform. Um, I had a, a wild uh, German boss, which is a story for uh, Forever Drinks, but we didn't get it across the line. But the Napster 2.0 that we were launching had, uh, it was decentralized, right? Before, before Web3 was a glint in anyone's eyes. We had community, we were adding in playlisting, which didn't exist at the time, uh, contextual commerce, ticketing, and there was even a physical side to the business as well. So really a complete kind of music experience. Um, didn't get it done. Streaming was born. And um, I think it's been uh, continuing for the last 20 years. So the other part of Napster, after the assets left Bertelsmann, they, they bounced around from uh, Roxio to Best Buy and ended up at a company called Real Networks who had launched the first streaming service in 2001 called Rhapsody. So uh, in 2010, the Rhapsody service was rebranded internationally as Napster and then in 2017 domestically in the US. So we have kind of a double DNA of both uh, being the original rebel, bringing us all digital music um, and potentially you know, also uh, social media and, and Netflix, et cetera, the digital media era and kind of the first trusted 999 service um, of streaming music that well, others- You set the 999 price point back then which still is what Spotify which only changed by a dollar. <laughs> That's right. Well, Spotify just changed it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so not not a lot to change. And I think in terms of the last um, 15, 20 years, that the ambition to Napster three, or as Napster, as Ralph was saying, Napster twenty 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 three, uh, was taken private last year by a group of investors, a mixture of DeFi and um, and uh, Web three investors and uh, and well, sorry, Wall Street investors. So uh, now the new mission of the company is to, to finally bring about the change we were trying to do back in, in 99. So we think the music industry is ready for a, a next act. No question. Um, and uh, streaming, as we all know, you know, Lisa from Goldman, fantastic report. And I think there's, there's more, more room to grow um, in traditional streaming, but really just international expansion, emerging markets. But the fundamental model is time for, a, for an update. So, uh, so yeah, so we're committed. A lot of the work that I did at Roblox in terms of connecting artists and fans and unlocking fandom. We've all heard about uh, serving the super fans. So it's really a platform shift from an access-based service, 9.99 for X amount of music, to a platform where we partner with artists and uh, help them reach their fans directly, own that relationship, mint digital goods. We bought a company called Mint Songs um, uh, last year, and um, then also creating digital experiences. And uh, also next year, there will be the, the Napster token to kind of bring uh, engagement and rewards around that whole experience. So kind of a, a, new, a new era uh, is, is being ushered in. So interesting thing is in this new roadway that you've been building very effectively, freeway, super highway, where you're looking at connecting artists and fans, and you'd mentioned the Goldman Sachs report talking about the very optimistic future of the music business, but also particularly fan engagement and what you're doing about connecting acts and fans to unlock opportunities, creating tools, to more of a partnership with labels, artists, decentralized music collectives, microtransactions, subscriptions. Is this all part of the menu of what Napster's bringing to basically enhance the speed of linkage 
between the avid fan user and the content? So first of all, when you do a prep with Ralph, he has incredible writing of notes and <laughs> remembers everything in writing that's so small I couldn't see even with his, with his glasses. Neither so, can I. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think we, you know, that, that there's been a centralization of, um, of music, both on the label side and at, uh, at DSPs. You, you go onto that Swedish site and, it, and it's all about their playlists and, and AI. And, and we feel music is more human. Um, so we're excited. And we have this notion that Ralph was mentioning around these decentralized music collectives. So think about, uh, could be a label collective, could be a brand collective, could be an artist collective, could be a playlist collective. So we would like to kind of blow up, you know, if anyone has been to Burning Man, these kind of camps, right? These creative camps that exist. Uh, Napster's the sort of digital plier, uh, if you will. And um, we want to be a partner, as Ralph was saying, not kind of a prisoner to this creativity. So we want to unleash the creativity. So, um, you know, a kid, we talk about Sergio in South Africa. Uh, he's a DJ and knows all the bands and he has great taste in music. So he wants to put together effectively what would be a label now. But he'll be able to do this on the platform, reach fans, kind of get artists together, and then other people can kind of back that collective. And as he becomes more popular and the artist becomes more popular, he could be the next equivalent of Interscope or whatever in the traditional label structure. So it's these decentralized collectives um, that we want to do uh, and power on the platform. Um, and then in terms of the, the tools, I think it's shifting from a mindset where the only output of an artist is a song. Um, and we found this at Roblox. You know, Josh was here talking on the last panel. So artists are really, if anyone is an artist, will work with them. They are 360 creative machines. They are not just people who output a song that can be captured as a stream. So the business model is old and we would like them, you know, to be able to capture their time in different ways in terms of connecting with their fans directly on the platform, uh, in terms of meet and greets and, uh, and live chats, in addition to digital goods, video, uh, audio, art, etc. So really opening up that direct relationship and seeing how the creativity unfolds. So really what you're doing is, this is a much wider extension of a and &R. It's not a and &R, it's I and R, innovation and repertoire. Because what you're looking at is innovating some of these new layers, which are all revenue producing, income generating. And this is 100,000 miles away from the original conception of Napster, but wider, better, more qualitative. Is your linkage primarily with Labels, managers, everybody, bra you'd mentioned brands, of course. So where well, you've got all of this volume, how do you actually run your INR and how do you target? So I, I think, again, you know, before with the Roblox metaphor, we, we, we enabled tools for right. all of these different creative groups to come onto the platform to build whatever they thought was appropriate for their audiences and, uh, and monetize. So in a similar way, uh, whoever... Uh, you gravitate towards in terms of your music taste and tastemakers, whether it's a festival, um, EDC, Glastonbury, Reading, you know, if it's a radio station, Radio One, if it's a, an artist, Diplo. So whoever these create, I happen to like Blanchel at the moment, for example. Uh, Blanchel, that's, so you just mentioned that briefly because you love them. I do, I do love her. So it's Partisan, which is a label, uh, one of my favorite labels, also Fontaine's DC. So, anyway, so wh whoever you happen to like and gravitate towards, they can have their own collectives where you can meet other fans who are, you know, into what you're into, um, other artists that associate with that music. And we're also exploring the notion of niche subscriptions. So now in the video space, all of us have, think of it, D DVCs, decentralized video collectives. Uh, they're not decentralized, they're centralized, but like a Hulu and a Netflix and a and a, and a max, et cetera, et cetera, where, oh, I like the TV shows and movies that this you know, uh, collective has, uh, has curated, and music, we don't have that. So we think it's exciting to consider micro subscriptions beyond the all-you-can-eat model um, that we've all been lumbered with the last 20 years. So if I happen to love Radio 1, maybe there's an opportunity to just subscribe to that for a, a dollar or a couple of dollars a month um, and kind of break it down. So you have these, these deeper experiences with uh, creative collectives that you connect to, could be Red Bull, you know, a lot of brands do fantastic work curating experiences. Right. And, uh, and we think that builds, again, uh, a deeper long tail for fan engagement than just the consumption of music in the background. So you mentioned DVCs, the video collectives, obviously important, and particularly with short form video, which clearly is just growing uh, exponentially across every uh, aspect of the music and the music development business. How many of you here are actively working on video collective type of approaches with your music so that you can make sure that you seed, feed, and, and provide this kind of video music element in all aspects of what you're doing. 
Is this something that you're seeing a lot of? Uh, I, I think artists, I mean, a lot of the, the developers at Roblox weren't necessarily camera, camera ready. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, developers who didn't even show their faces to each other, uh, but they would develop these amazing creative experiences. I think obviously artists are much more comfortable yeah. being on stage and, and video as part of the mix. That's so um, so yeah, so I, I think it's again empowering and seeing the artists, which I started my career actually in Asia, uh, as Ralph knows, back in the 90s um, in, in Hong Kong working for BMG. So the notion of that 360 artist, where a lot of the talent that we worked with back then were, were models and actors and singers and could, could do everything and had uh, consumer products businesses. So I think it's seeing uh, yourself as an artist as a, as a way that you are interesting in many ways to your fans. And uh, I think there are you know, a lot of examples that we see on social media uh, and short form, whether it's covers or, or sing-alongs and duetting and behind the scenes and all that content is kind of wasted currently on DSPs. So the notion, I was with a company the other day in New York who put out, um, so they were working with a band who put out their uh, video, which would usually just go onto YouTube and they got the core fans to actually pay five bucks, thousands of fans to watch the video early. So thinking about all these assets that you create that generally don't have value um, and bringing them back into your collective where your fans can you know, either earn them right, through being good fans of yours or, or maybe even pay to create this net new revenue. This reminds me of the BTS live TV broadcast that was in America, 700,000 people paying $20 a pop for this particular thing. But what you've said makes absolute sense. And with your focus on Asia and Asia Pacific, you speak Mandarin, you speak Chinese, you study Chinese, you're very familiar within the Asian perspective. And in terms of the Asia territories and Asia markets, uh, do you have any particular focus? Are you doing anything, for example, in the local languages, Bahasa and in Indonesia? Are you doing anything uh, in Thailand and any of the Asia markets? Because clearly what you're doing with Napster is really tailor-made for uh, original music from every territory in Asia. Yeah, so I, I think, um, so we're not in Asia yet, but uh, we are planning to come to Asia Great. Uh, you know, early next year and the end of this year. Um, I think a lot of what's happening, if you look at the Chinese markets, a lot of Westerners who, who don't speak um, or read Chinese, it's difficult to access the, the music apps in, in China. But if you do, I mean, they are so fundamentally different from what you would expect from a, a Spotify. Um, I think our Chinese um, team member did a, a voiceover and it had you know, like 21 different features and tabs within the app. So there's already a lot of innovation happening in, in the China market, in the Korean market. Um, and other markets around Asia. So we look to Asia definitely as a kindred spirit in terms of innovation that's happening here. And then in terms of the audiences, I was in India earlier this, we earlier this year. So I think a lot of these new models, especially like the micro subscription, we think are very applicable to the Asia region where people are maybe not comfortable with the full subscription price, but could kind of engage at smaller ticket amounts to start to get into that um, paid experience uh, that, that we have in the West versus just a free kind of video experience. And this micro subscription um, product that is really starting to gather tremendous amount of movement and certainly across Asia is the way that fans can actually communicate with each other then become micro subscribers that then gets them to spread the word and this is the way that you get avid user behaviors. That's right yeah I think all of us in the in the real world you know again with the original Napster I met a ton of friends uh, on the platform broadened my music taste was you know getting into remixes from people in Germany and Albania and Japan. And so I think that community was stripped out of, uh, and the social aspect was stripped out of music services. Right. So we think it's key. It's how we will connect. It's what, it, you know, I'll talk your ear off about, about bands that I like right now or, or labels or, or festivals. So that, that's how we connect in the real world. It's how we engage. So, so yeah, I think that's the notion of the collective where if people can get together, um, be a part of these communities where the communities can help the artists within the community, the artists can help each other. Um, we think this is how people get fandom because you learn about um, more about the artists. You can see them behind the scenes. You can you kind of connect. You know more about them, and then you want to tell your friends about them as opposed to just having the the industry. I think get shorter and shorter. We have a thirteen year old, and and her, her, her view of music is getting you know six seconds. It's like I, I kind of remember that hook, right? But we want to go the other direction and deepen fan engagement again, uh, and that's where we think the exciting new era of the big, of the business will uh, will go. Well, this gives you just a tiny little sliver of the new ways in which you can do stuff. And John, I would have to say, I, you've completely changed my thinking on what Napster is and does. Not that I had an old um, version of it, because Napster and the technology, and certainly the technology you've acquired, is all very much about the bleeding edge of tomorrow rather than the bleeding edge of yesterday. 
and what you're doing and what you've described in this session today hopefully will give you all a much broader, interesting view of how widely you can use stuff. And John, you're here for today and tomorrow at All That Matters, and you are keen to meet people who are interested in wanting to do business with Napster? Yes, I'm, I'm here, here all week through F1 as well, if anyone's around. Um, and uh, yeah, I think as a, as a closing note, that I, I always felt my old label friends in, in this industry were feeling that innovation, they're kind of like lobotomized, that innovation could never really happen, that we were stuck with the model we're stuck with. But I think looking at people around the room, I see you know, that the message is innovation is, uh, is possible. I think we all need to team together. There's great innovation. The amount of new startups that have happened in the last two or three years, it feels like the late 90s again. So uh, I encourage you, innovation can happen. The small guys can become the big guys. And again, it's this platform approach where we feel honoring that relationship between artist and fan as a partner and enabling you know, artists and anyone in the, in the industry to um, kind of do their job and sustain a living is, uh, is very possible. We all need to kind of team together. And we're very excited again about, about playlists. We think there's a lot of uh, value that has been lost in playlists. Another theme over drinks is like the curator economy, which we can chat about. Anyway, short session, we're off. Well, so there we are to close. It's not just A&R, it's I&R and A&R. John Vlasopoulos, thank you Ralph so much. Thank, thank you. you very much.